All right, everybody, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so we've got a couple of presentations in this session. Um, I'm going to do a presentation, and then Ben is, and then we'll sort of open it up for questions or discussion. Um, and so I'm going to go first, and my presentation is Ohm's Avalon and IU's Bicentennial Oral History Project. So both of these are going to be about um, Ohm's, the oral history metadata synchronizer related things. Um, so I'm John Cameron. Yes. Is your microphone on? I think it's, it's a little hard to hear. I, I, I clip it, it's too light. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to go like this. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Right, so I'm John Cameron. I'm the Digital Media Service Manager for the Indiana University Libraries. Um, and I'm also one of the product owners of Avalon. And um, my work um, on what I'm going to talk about today kind of crosses over into both. I'm going to start um, by talking about the background of the project that I'm going to introduce, the uh, Bicentennial Oral History Project at IU. Um, then I'm going to talk about OMS. Um, so what is it? Um, why do people use it? Um, what are its features? And then I'm going to talk about Avalon in Ohm. So the, um, the work that was done and how you can use um, Avalon as a source um, in Ohm for that sort of work. And then I'm going to talk about the work that I'm actually doing on the project itself. So the projectors are a little low res, so it's a little fuzzy. Um, but the IU Bicentennial has a number of different projects. So it's going to consider to be a big to-do. It's our 200 year anniversary. Um, and uh, there are a number of signature projects, is what they call them, um, and the Oral History Project is one. So it started in 2008, so they've been going for a long time, and it's really ramped up lately. So um, as they note on their website, they have over a thousand stories. Um, they have many, many hundreds of interviews uh, with audio recordings for each. And as part of the work they're doing, full transcripts for each interview. Um, and their website is at 200.i.edu which is the uh, Bicentennial website, and you can find out um, more there if you want to check it out. So talking about the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer. Um, so oralhistoryonline.org is the URL for this. Um, and it is a tool for oral histories, um, specifically for oral history recordings. Um, so it's kind of broken up into two things that I'm going to cover each. Um, the first is OMS. Um, which is where you create an enhanced oral history metadata. And then there's a separate viewer application um, that actually presents the media um, along with all sort of the time-based metadata that you can add to it within the OMS application itself. Here's kind of like how it's laid out. So interview information goes into OMS. Um, in our case, it's people who work for the Bicentennial um, Oral History Project are sort of working on that. They're working on these interviews. The output of that is an XML file that goes into this viewer, and that goes onto a website where people can go and access it and actually listen and see these recordings. So OMS um, is essentially a platform for, I think they, yeah, I think they use the word enhancing metadata for oral history recordings. So it's a closed source platform where there's just one running instance, and everybody shared that. So it's free to use. Um, anybody can go do it. And it's a very popular project um, because it is free. Um, it sort of fulfills a niche in terms of people who want to mark up oral history recordings and then present them in a dynamic way. It doesn't uh, have a huge learning curve. Um, and it's originally developed by the Nunn Center uh, for Oral History at University of Kentucky Libraries, um, although it is now managed by AVP. So some of the features that it provides um, is transcript syncing. So transcripts for oral history recordings um, Within OMS, you can go and mark off time points. So each minute, you can mark where in the transcript that is. And then when people go and view the transcript, they can easily sort of see um, and navigate to those time points um, when they're sort of going through the recording. The other thing that it provides is indexing, um, which is basically setting a range of time and setting a bunch of descriptive metadata for it. So OMS also provides an interface to do this. So you sort of scrub along through the recording, you can tag a point that you want to do, and then you can add um, titles, partial transcripts, keywords, um, adding controlled vocabulary, all sorts of different things to add metadata to pieces so that it makes it easier to navigate through these very long world history recordings. Um, so the OMS output, um, as I mentioned, is XML. XML. Um, 
And it's basically a big blob that contains everything um, that goes on within Ohm. So it contains all the syncing information, it contains the actual full transcript itself, um, so it's an easy to sort of move around a file that contains all that information. Um, right, so it's got the descriptive metadata, it's got information on the media source, um, and sync data and indexes, and everything sort of goes within the XML file. So now to talk um, a bit about the viewer. So the viewer is the way you actually uh, <laughs> can consume the documents that you've marked up or that people have marked up in OMS. Um, unlike the OMS application itself, the OMS viewer is open source. It's a PHP application that's freely available on the University of Kentucky's GitHub page. Um, and it's designed to be used um, anywhere. So you go in, you use OMS to um, make all these oral history recordings, um, you sort of you know, metadata rich, and then use this application to display them wherever. Um, so plugins exist. Um, because you definitely want to use it in exhibit software and digital collection software, such as Omega. Um, and it allows you to navigate by transcripts, um, by index. It's got built-in searching, and it consumes that OMS XML file. So here's what it looks like. Um, so this is sort of the plain vanilla um, look to it. So up here, you'll have the media player itself. Um, and here, see, you've got transcript view. You can flip back and forth between transcript or index view. Um, you can search keywords, and it will return hits in the transcript. And then you can click this and go directly to that location in the transcript. So the whole point is to make it easy to navigate. Um, and if you flip over to the index portion, you can see, for example, this is an example uh, file. But um, it's basically got timestamps and then all this extra metadata about that particular part of the recording. Um, and so here's an example of the OMS player that's embedded within a page on the Nun Center's um, own website, where they basically have a, this blacklight instance, and they have kind of this big custom-built search application. And then inside, um, they've got a bunch of different metadata and views. And if you go to the Access tab, you'll see the embedded OMS player, and you can listen to the recording and get access to all the extra um, metadata and navigation. Okay, so Avalon and OMS. Um, OMS can use a bunch of different media sources. Um, as you saw, it's basically going with a little media player at the top of the page. And that media player um, is essentially either an embed from a media source site, so YouTube or SoundCloud, um, or just uses sort of a, a basic default player if you're using uh, basic HTTP streaming to refer to the file on the web. Um, so now we have the ability to use Avalon as a media source within OMS. So you can see here, this is the metadata form um, for our record in OMS. Um, might be a little hard to see. But um, basically, you've got the list of options here, and you can just select Avalon now. Um, and basically, you just drop in the embed code, the straight HTML embed code, like you would be putting it into a web page. And, um, and OMS knows what to do with that. Um, one of the cool Avalon-specific features um, is the ability to um, account for persistent URLs. Um, so a lot of Avalon instances for library archive purposes might be set up for um, use with a Perl. And here we have the embed code that uses a Perl, and then there's a specific target domain. So this is pointing to the actual you know, URL for a production instance of Avalon, meaning questions online. Um, and then we have the Perl down there, so just in case the URL to the content um, never changes, we have the persistent URL that will always redirect to the right place. And I got tough to see, but this is the Avalon player just embedded. So you'll see the player um, appearance will change depending on what service it's used um, because it's just an embedded. Um, so quick summary again. So now you're able to use media from Avalon within Ohms. Um, so funding for this was done as part of this Bicentennial Oral History Project. Um, the Bicentennial Office provided funding for us to be able to uh, work with ABP to develop the support for Avalon within the software. Um, so it's made possible with the Avalon Player API. And um, basically, OMS uses APIs to interact with whatever different media source. Um, and because it's a closed source application, we had to work with ABP to make sure that that happened. Um, but it's basically just yeah, setting a wrapper around those API calls so that the uh, media player can be
directly to uh, all the metadata that's sort of set. Okay, so the Bicentennial Oral History Project itself. Um, so the Bicentennial Oral History Project, as I mentioned, has hundreds of different interviews. Um, and right now, all of their materials are stored in a box. So they've got the original audio files, transcript documents, uh, workflow documents, and metadata spreadsheets. Um, so here's an example of kind of what that looks like. So they render everything out, and this is sort of like a final deliverable um, on their end. So they have the highest quality version of the recording that they have. In this case, it's going to be three. In other cases, it might be wave. Um, they have a word document, which contains the final transcript, which is corrected by staff. Um, and then there's a VTT file, which is um, a derivative from uh, the automatic process that they use the Bicentennial Office, because of the large volume of uh, the content that they had, um, decided to go with a vendor that would create automatic transcripts uh, from the audio recordings, and then they would correct that um, with staff, with real humans. And then <coughs> the VTT sort of sits alongside, um, just for reference purposes. Okay. So the first thing to do is take the files, um, the actual audio files, along with the metadata, and get them into our production avalanche since um, so, the way to do that is just map from the metadata spreadsheet that they have made available um, into an Avalon batch manifest format, so we can create the records in Avalon and get those pearls. So once the items are published in Avalon, the pearl, gen or the pearl service will generate that pearl, and then I can use that um, to basically create the record for homes. Um, so here's sort of a, an example of what that might look like in Avalon. Content will be available in our Avalon instance, although it's really not meant to be the primary repository for it. And eventually, we'll be adding uh, a link out to the exhibit site that will sort of display actually all this content. Um, so, writing to the OMS XML format um, is done with a little bit of Ruby scripting um, and the you Notebook know, Theory library. So, basically, taking the Word document, the transcripts. Um, the Perl, so it knows which Avalon um, record to go to, and then the VTT file to do some um, first guess, sort of time stamping um, in the OMS way, and then we get an XML file that gets to go into OMS. Um, interviews then are sort of reviewed, they'll be given the OK, um, and then within OMS you can just re-export out that XML. So you can round trip the XML as many times as you'd like within OMS to change things up. Um, and so the ultimate goal is to get all these interviews um, and all the metadata and transcript information on the web. Um, so we want to have every interview available online, um, provide an interface for users to browse and search. Um, and so the idea was to use Omeka to do this. So there's an Omeka plugin for the OMS viewer. Um, and we wanted to have a special um, solar index containing all the text from all the transcripts so that if people were searching for keywords, um, something specific about campus or something of interest to them, um, results would be returned that were sort of drawn from all the transcript information. Um, and, you know, there's some other things that were wanted. But, um, ABP has a new platform that we're investigating which provides sort of those same things. So, the thing about OMS is that there's OMS and then there's the OMS viewer, but there's no sort of platform um, for you to be able to sort of dump a bunch of XML files in and get sort of the interface where you can search across them, um, do something nice. Generally, the idea is that you use Omeka or a different tool and sort of build your own site to exhibit all these different things. Um, so Aviary is a work in progress application that AVP is developing for Yale. Um, and so we're currently in the phases of starting to evaluate it and see if it might meet our needs. Um, so they've designed it it's not really a successor to OMS, it's more of um, a platform, again, for like searching across and navigating. And it contains a very like, sort of OMS similar interface where a transcript is displayed alongside the media content that you can navigate um, and you can search across. So it sort of meets the demands. Um, now I'm going to hit over
Okay, can everybody hear me? Good, great. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a similar effort that we embarked on at Columbia, and I'm going to be doing it in my, my trademark self-product style. So I'm going to start with the summary slide that lets you know what's at the end, so you can ignore maybe the next 10 minutes of stuff that I say about interfaces. Um, we worked with DCE and another consultancy called IIA to build out a JavaScript widget that does much of the OHM's editorial work. The, uh, it provides an HTML UI that lets you compose the synchronized index descriptions and gives you a way, if you have a transcript, a plain text transcript, to, uh, to attach time codes to it that allow you to use that transcript as a way to navigate media as well. It exports those data as WebVTT, and there's a, a mechanism like the Ohms Viewer for previewing those things, and it's publicly available over this GitHub repository. Okay, uh, integration and implications. Uh, so we we have a tendency, I think, to naturalize the term interface as a thing that uh, that people do in software, and it comes really readily to us. But it's an old word. Uh, it goes back a long way in the physical sciences. Uh, and there it is often about uh, not distinguishing what happens when, uh, when two different substances come into contact, but it can also be used as a way to distinguish when you start thinking about something that was an undifferentiated mass as more than one thing, what the distinguishing characteristics are of these new categories that you've, uh, that you've put forward. And that is the definition that Marshall McLuhan was interested in in the 60s when you might think people were starting to uh, use computers as the central organizing metaphor of, uh, of everything that they think about. Uh, but here actually was interested in, uh, in similar fluid dynamics and astronomical phenomenon, and in particular saying that when you talk about the interface of things that are, uh, are previously understood to be distinct, that they change. And some of that change is at the boundary itself, the point of contact, how things communicate. But it's also about the establishment of a new thing, that when two things that were separate come together, there is a third a third previously non-existent whole entity. And that lines up with the actual definition of integrate, uh, which is another word that we use very loosely in, uh, in our field, but is uh, originally intended to be something that, uh, to be uh, uh, the action of making something whole. There's an act of imagination uh, in that, which I'll, I'll come back to later. But coming back to, to interfaces, so I think when we talk about proposing an interface, the questions that, that I am starting to think about are uh, what we're defining, and that's another way of saying what are we actually distinguishing as, uh, as two identifiable and consistently identifiable things, but also what is, uh, what is undifferentiated. So when you establish an interface, there might also be things that previously were distinct entities that you have decided you are going to reckon with as a single category. Is that, am I okay with everybody right now? Okay, because that was a point of lookness. I'm just kidding. Uh, so when we're talking about integrating something, which is a task I'm, I'm uh, set up with fairly frequently, I'm trying to figure out now what the resulting system is that is not necessarily the thing that we do. It's a subtle distinction maybe between incorporating and integrating, but what I'm suggesting here is that, uh, that sometimes when we have an interface, that we should start to think about integrations along those interfaces as a creative act that results in something that actually didn't exist before. And those interfaces should be thought about uh, perhaps more broadly than we sometimes think about them. So of course there's controls or user interfaces, but, uh, but the data, that you decide to collect in a, in a system is a type of interface, as are the functions of that system, because it is a way that the system or the components of the system uh, communicate with the users. Uh, there are also diachronic interfaces. Diachronic just means something that happens over time, and I think it's, it's useful to talk about here uh, the data storage as distinct from data as an interface with your system as it is now, and your system as it will be some, at some point in the future. Likewise, test documentation are useful diachronic interfaces for the people who work in these systems, and the future people that will use them. 
So in our defining interfaces, we're bringing two or more entities into communication. We're identifying the relationship between them or electing to no longer think of things as different. This is redundant, but, but it's an essay. Uh, so that brings us to OMS, uh, which thank you for introducing John because I don't have good material for it. Uh, OMS is an interface between people as well as a data system. Uh, it's a way for an oral historian to describe something in a way that, uh, that an audience that they imagine might find useful. And it's also an interface between systems in the XML formats that, uh, uh, that it uses. So we were set out with a uh, uh, with a grant uh, a grant proposition to integrate ohms into our digital library, and that's more or less the instruction that we were given. And that's what brings me back to the, the conversation we were there. Because what does that mean to integrate it that in the digital library? What's the thing that we are imag imagining did not exist before and comes into being by bringing these two systems into contact together? And one way that we might approach that integration is to uh, take resources from our digital library and try to have them assume the relatively narrow form of embeddable media. There we would be uh, subsuming ourselves into ohms uh, to a certain extent. But we wanted to think about what we actually wanted out of that integration. And there were some things that worked against uh, that, that type of approach. So one was that. Uh, the oral historians at Columbia wanted to have local management of their data. They wanted to continue to own and know the, uh, the location of and management principles uh, supporting the preservation of those data. They wanted the editorial interface that they would use to compose the synchronized material to be available in the same system they used to catalog those materials. And they wanted some recognition that regardless of how we did that, OMS is a de facto professional standard for oral historians. And if they were going to incorporate these features into our digital library in service of an oral history research program, they wanted the students in that program to be able to participate in a broader disciplinary conversation with oral historians who use OMS. And finally, as a kind of nice to have, they thought it would be useful if things could be reused somewhere besides Columbia. So we, uh, we uh, almost right away, ask, uh, found ourselves asking some questions about the data issues and the degree to which the particular data serializations that motivate OMS are a part of its functional promise. And if we change them, uh, whether we would be changing the interface, which I think is, is clearly true. So we talked about different possibilities here again, using a local installation of OMS and trying to repurpose the data it produced. And we talked about building basically a, uh, what we used to call a hydrohead, a Sandera component that would allow you to roll this kind of editorial feature and display feature into an existing Sandera application. And finally, we talked about uh, at least exploring the degree to which a lot of this could be uh, done entirely in a front end component and that we could continue to use the network and data transmission over the network as the interface along which we would integrate. And that is ultimately what we decided to do with the goal of, as I said earlier, uh, constructing an HTML UI for authoring these descriptions. Expressing those two types of description as WebVTT and, uh, and presenting those descriptions as, uh, as navigation interfaces for the media subsequently in our digital library site. So uh, this work went forward in two phases with two different, uh, two different contractors, one of which was DCE, who worked with us to develop the specifications with recourse to OMS that needed to be supported in these features. And the implementation was pursued by a contractor that has never worked with the same Vera partner before, so far as we know. So some new interfaces were illuminated by this. There are uh, tons of assumptions of practice within the Sangura community that were simply absent with this new developer. Uh, and there are, uh, I, I'm saying here, uh, sometimes excessive definitions of interfaces. It was extremely difficult for us not to set out as a requirement uh, IIIFAB support, which is a, a bit of running before we could walk. Uh, and 
before we had identified how we would use that interface regardless. We also found that our existing experience with, uh, with IIIF set up some, uh, some fairly strict developer expectations about how a module like this would work, namely that the developers who work on our digital library app had uh, a demand that they would be able to write out little more than an HTML div and call a JavaScript function passing the ID to that div and everything else would fall out of that. But they wanted to be more or less blissfully ignorant of the internals of the, of the JavaScript component. Uh, and we did this. Uh, it's what's in that GitHub repository. Uh, there are some, uh, some linked pages in, in GitHub pages that allow you to experiment with some open media about the composition of those index documents and synchronizing transcripts and seeing them downloaded as WebVTT. I will spare you the uh, a view of what a WebVTT file looks like. So our, our ongoing work in future direction is to continue to investigate Drupal IFAB support and to look at changing the, uh, the output serialization. So the OMS XML is a bit like a METS file. It's got, it's got two distinct entities in it and packaging information around it. WebVTT we like because it's uh, a much more broadly supported standard, but it only has one stream of commentary. A thing that is intriguing about using the, uh, the annotations that, uh, that are available in IIIF manifest is that it allows you to, uh, to package both of those streams together again. So we'd like to look at, uh, at using that. We're also interested in what the discovery considerations are of the index document. So we have, uh, we've never searched for fragments before and, uh, and many of the things that we are exposing are, are in our discovery interfaces right now are things that a, uh, a reader or patron would be interested in uh, in whole. But some of the oral histories that we are publishing under, uh, under the auspices of this Carnegie grant are quite long, and it is often the case that people are only interested in very narrow bands of it. So there's a, uh, the Ed Koch oral, oral history is many hours of recorded interviews, and if you're only interested in the parts that are about support for parks or rent control, uh, you need a way to focus. Uh, so uh, forgive me, but I, a, a little bit of, uh, of philosophizing uh, about this stuff again. Mm -hmm. When we talk about how we're moving forward as a community in Sambera, uh, we frequently take recourse to, uh, to fairly granular definitions based in software libraries about what we might do. And I'd like to invite people to instead think about instead what the desired end result is. If it's a community that's built around shared business understandings that support libraries or research institutions, or whether it's in fact a Rails development uh, collective. And if you really want to, you can ask me how I think this relates to LVP. But I'll, I'll leave that for questions. Uh, I'm Barb Tour, almost everyone. Thanks.
describing the interview. The interview is an interface between usually two individuals. So this super right. So I just sort of want to appreciate that, um, what you brought forward. And i um, just wondering if you are going, if, if you've been able to stumble forward from the, the work that you've done with, with the synchronizer, if like it, it helped illuminate any of that for you as far as like where you want to take it. It definitely changed the way that, uh, that I've tried to, uh, to think about some of our projects in the consensus building aspect going forward. So I, I think a, uh, a way to think about that in particular between the, the machine-human interfaces that we're talking about here and uh, what I was saying about interfaces sometimes collapsing categories instead of distinguishing things, that it is unlikely that any given oral historian on your campus really cares whether ohms or something that looks like ohms is the thing that is allowing them to do this work. They're interested in a particular type of scholarship and a particular way to communicate the results of that scholarship to people. And I don't think you have to squint very hard uh, to say that's a lot like saying we will spare this client the, uh, the particulars of, uh, of how we produce this, uh, this data but we are going to make it look like a GraphQL. Uh, so that, I think, is I, I, trying to find those places, identify the places where key stakeholders have fundamentally different concerns and making sure that very early on in a project we can pivot to them with those concerns and surface them as the, uh, as the requirements going forward before we get into the implementation business is, is definitely a change. But, um, it makes me think about um, you know sort of the, the format and sort of what is the interface uh, sort of, you know what I sort of left off that Ben mentioned is that ohms is sort of the go-to um, you know it's a really commonly used it's sort of the one that oral historians know about and will go to and you know that means a lot I think the fact that they have workshops good documentation you know all that stuff it provides the interface for people to do that work in a way that really isn't widely available in a standardized way elsewhere. Um, and in the future, I can see other ways where we can do, you know, that interfacing in an interoperable way. Um, you know, IIIF Manifest would be a great sort of medium for this. Because you know, WebVTT provides a lot more granular information. I think you know, if the people. Um, behind Ohms, Doug Boyd and others had sort of, you know, gone back to the beginning, they might have designed it a little differently. There are certainly uh, kludgy things and drawbacks, um, but the fact that it's, it's got such a stake, you know, and people were asking me about it um, well before this project came along and we got the funding, they, you know, world historians at Indiana were kind of like, hey, can we get Avalon into Ohms? You know, it's just something that people hear about and want, um, and, you know, once they get very familiar with the system, they get excited about using it. Um, with the ultimate goal, you know, the interface being like, I have this whole wealth of material and I want to make it accessible to everybody on the web. Um, you know, in a way where they can find what they're looking for and it can be like a kind of pleasurable thing for this to browse this collection, um, you know, sort of in a digital collections way and then sort of in a cultural heritage kind of way, like especially for us um, and, and all the work that they've done. So that you know, it's, it's kind of like only a, a small part of like the countless hours that have gone into like my project, Bicentennial, um, and all the people that uh, you know are sort of working their butts off and putting hours into like amassing this collection that I'm sort of processing in a way that we can make it public. It's just sort of bridging that gap, which is cool. I think, and to go, sorry, just one more thing. The, uh, against what I was uh, I was saying, because there's also some ways that 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 new entities became apparent by defining some of these interfaces. The first time that we demoed this integrated into, uh, or with our, uh, our digital library system to special collections librarians, they were immediately excited about its application to things that were not oral histories at all and didn't have transcripts. So they were interested in this as a, as a way to publish music annotations alongside of the media or to describe arbitrary video that is you know, documentary and not an oral history. So 
when you provide something like that and then these new audiences come into being, that again, the, the system and its requirements change almost immediately by the addition of those conversations and it's, it's uh, another thing to recognize. So uh, we also have a use case of having very long interviews where people often want to find a small part that they're interested in. And the best that we've come up with so far is providing transcripts next to the video that people can kind of zoom to keywords that they type in and then sync, you know, or click on the thing. Um, which is okay. Uh, it's a little clunky. I was just wondering if, you know, if, if you could expound on some of the approaches like you have a two-hour interview, you have some of those very popular and interesting. What are the avenues <coughs> by which people are most likely to try to find that little chunk? And I'll say is when you, when you are, if, if you come in just at the media level, uh, that, that kind of in, that interface is what we're presenting, something like that. And for me, it's the, when we, uh, when we pivot to something like WebVTT or something that emulates those, uh, those annotation documents or, uh, has a stronger resemblance there, then if you're used to working in a solar context, it's, it's very easy to move to saying like, these are, these are other documents that I might surface and, uh, in the search and discovery interface and have them point into uh, offset, uh, offset moments in the media. So that's you know, kind, of a, kind of an answer, I guess. <laughs> So the Ohm's, uh, you know, style is I'm going to put minute timestamps on, you know, right down to the character within the transcript itself. And then when you search, um, like I had a, a still up that probably went by too fast, but if you search for like Elmer, this guy mentions this dude Elmer, you know, five times and it shows you those five hits. And if you click it, it goes right to that in the transcript, but there's no way to like go directly to when he's saying that, you have to like click the nearest, you know, minute interval and sort of listen from there. And so one of the, oh yeah, okay. Keep talking. All right, so that's, um, you know, and it's sort of like one of the weird OMSI things. Um, and one of the interesting things about like new platforms, that, you know, you, you don't have to be tied to that. Um, I think why Aviary from AVP is going to like a web VTT internal format, you know, you can have more granular sort of time. Um, there's no, you know, technical reason why you couldn't try to, you know, narrow it even further or, you know, do different sort of pattern matching to get different results in, you know, a body of text. Um, they've even, I think, gone so far as to, like, see if, you know, we can sort of guesstimate within, like, a particular, uh, you know, seven words in a VTT file, like, I want to click this word and go immediately to that specific portion of the report. Um, and I, I haven't played a lot with Triple yet, but I, I have the understanding that you can you can have time stamp annotations, correct? And you can you can clip you can basically make clips, right? Yeah. So then I guess my next thing that I'd be really interested to try is when you have like a single object in your repository and somebody searches, you know, Obama, and that is mentioned like five times in a two-hour interview or something like that. Then you can actually have five different search results of the same asset, what we, what we would call an asset, but um, you know, clipped up using triple F manifests that maybe are augmented uh, with user search input. Does that make sense? Something like that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, for what it's for what it's worth, Esme was suggesting earlier today that once you arrive at an asset view that the same data that you used to drive the discovery that got you to the asset you might be repurposed within the IIIF uh, media presentation to do content searching there. So there's some overlap with earlier presentations today. <laughs> sure. It kind of like the side step too is the whole concept of indexing, right? So like someone is curating portions of an interview with very specific metadata that they sort of want you to look into. And so I think it's you know kind of a difference of navigation, like do I just want to search Obama or am I sort of going through the content in a more, you know, uh, am I coming at it in a different way? I think it probably depends on the user. 
you know, is it is it somebody who's doing research or is it somebody who's just like I'm hoping to find a couple of hits in this collection of stuff? Yeah. But indexing is of course you know it takes a professional, um, it takes a lot of time, um, and that's part of the reason why it's not being done for the IU Bicentennial Project. That's why having having transcripts be searchable. Um, you know, uh, to a, to a granular level was important to them because they want people to like search by keywords, but they you know they just don't have the resources to do hundreds and hundreds of um, transcripts of varying lengths and they get which you might also say, like, an interface is a place where I can stop caring. Um, we have all this, in, in the development of this project, there is a lot of, of wailing and gnashing of teeth about picking what our serialization format was going to be. And when you arrive at, at producing anything, then you subsequently start to ask, why does that matter for the client so much? Like, why does that have to propagate backwards? Uh, into the repository. So right now we're we're dealing with this stuff as files, but in the uh, in the same way that in, that LDP puts forward the idea that uh, a resource with attached metadata might present itself in different representations, it's not very hard for me to say the types of repositories that you're interacting with, the types of interfaces you're providing, might use content negotiation in both directions to allow people to serialize or deserialize that. Uh, that descriptive data in different ways. Ultimately, the difference between a IIIF manifest that has two different annotation lists that describe these things and an OMS XML file is just a matter of client preference and not the data itself. And the LDP? LDP also <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is uh, about allowing the serialization of the representation of a resource to be determined by client preferences and not the data themselves. Don't you think? <laughs> it could be implemented separately. It always does. <laughs> Pursuing what at one level is going to be a fundamentally similar development task, if the way that you understand the work is uh, is to identify at a very high level these these functions, it's eventually going to have an impact on the way that you do that work, and certainly the way that you prioritize the work that you do going forward. So I, I don't. It's there's always a, a, a you know. I, if you work for an organization that goes through a strategic directions initiative or, or something like that, right? Like this is it's 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 easy to understand this stuff as being very divorced from low level work, but it it matters for how you select the work that you're going to do, how you prioritize different potential approaches to that work. So if it's if it's specifically important to you that you are working at a high level 
integrating across interfaces that don't have anything to do with Ruby, then you are probably going to pursue your Ruby work with an emphasis on points of contact that don't assume that as the, uh, as the other partner entity uh, across the interface, right? Yeah, I think there are interesting implications for what happens to an organization in the long haul as well, because if you have a community of wealth developers, then it will always be a community of wealth developers. If you have a community of people who are building a certain sort of system that happen to be using Rails at the moment, when Rails becomes uncool, as it surely will at some point in the future, five years, maybe, um, that community might evolve and pick the next great solution and still be that community. Well, thanks, y'all. Those are great questions.